Go ahead. Welcome back to Musically Speaking. I hope that you are all safe and well. Uh, for those of you who are regulars, thank you for watching in such numbers over the last few months. I do hope you've been enjoying these conversations. And for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, my name is Alexander Shelley. I'm the Music Director of Canada's National Arts Centre Orchestra, based, based in the nation's capital, uh, just across the road from Parliament at Canada's flagship performing arts institution, the National Arts Centre. Uh, I'm speaking to you from my home in London, England, where I've been since the beginning of lockdown with my family. I'm missing my orchestra very much, and all of us at the NAC are in turn missing uh, those of you who belong to our wider family, our audience, our patrons, our supporters and friends. We cannot wait to be together again with you as soon as possible. Uh, and to everyone else who's been joining us from around Canada and from around the world, a very, very warm welcome to you. I'm so grateful that you're with us here today. Uh, in this Musically Speaking series, I welcome stars of the music world with a particular focus on Canada to tell us about themselves, to talk about their life and art and to field not just my questions, but your questions. So please let us know if you have any questions during today's discussion. And my wonderful assistant, Kelly, who's behind the scenes, will feed them to me um, uh, if you write them in the chat box. Now, over the last few weeks, uh, I've had the pleasure of speaking to James Ennis, Gabriela Montero, Misha Broker gossman Jan Lyshetsky, and most recently, Jeremy Dutcher. But even amongst those illustrious names, uh, today's guest is very special. If there were a, a short list of the most interesting and accomplished individuals on Earth, uh, forgive me, Earth and space, uh, then she would surely be on it. She's originally from Montreal, Quebec. She studied both at her home and abroad to become an electrical and computer engineer before working with IBM and Bell Northern uh, in computer research of natural language processing, automatic speech recognition, and application of interactive technologies in space. She joined the Canadian Space Agency as a member of the Astronaut Corps in 1992, qualifying, amongst other things, as a military jet captain and deep water scuba diver in the following years. She completed her first flight to the International Space Station as part of the STS-96 mission on Discovery in uh, June 99, and her second with the shuttle Endeavour in, Ju in July 2009 on STS-127. And she served in between those two flights as capsule communicator at NASA Mission Control Center in Houston and as the Canadian Space Agency's chief astronaut. She holds honorary degrees from 18 different Canadian universities. She speaks six languages and is a skilled athlete and musician. On October 2nd, 2017, she was sworn in as the 29th federal vice regal representative of Queen Elizabeth, on the second, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. And on Monday of this week, he here it is, she won a Juno Award for Classical Choral Album of the Year as a member of the Ottawa Bach Choir. So as I mentioned to my team at the NAC a few days ago, if anybody is ever feeling good about themselves and what they've achieved in life, they need to read this CV because it will, if you'll excuse the pun, bring them back to earth. Um, and the thing is, I had to cut a lot out of that CV. So please join me in welcoming uh, the Governor General of Canada, Her Excellency, the Right Honourable Julie Payette. Hello, Hi. that was very kind How introduction. You? Thank you. I'm doing great. Oh, it's, it's not kind. I, I One of the great pleasures of, of these talks is I spend a week researching and I, I thought I knew a fair bit about you, but I mean, one could spend years listening to you and reading about you and discover more and more. It's, it's extraordinary. So thank you uh, for being with us and congratulations on your Juno. You must be thrilled. Oh, we were so Happy. We're, we're a small choir, a small professional choir. I'm not part of the professional part, but uh, and uh, and the choir, you know how it is. Yeah, it's a small ensemble. It, it's not easy to make a living out of this. And then out of the blue, our name comes out for the Juno. Uh, we were ecstatic, so proud, so happy. Um, I think we're going to celebrate as soon as we can. Yes. Yeah, quite right. Let's hope it's sooner rather than later. How long have you been a member of the choir, actually? Uh, since I, I, I moved to Ottawa, mm -hmm. uh, if you may not remember, but uh, I actually sang with uh, the NAC the, for uh, Christmas 2017. I was sworn in in October 2017, but already I was singing with the Messiah Chorus. I in, remember. Uh, December, because I needed, uh, when I arrived in Ottawa, um, I was by myself. Uh, it, it was overwhelming. This is a big job. And I needed to anchor myself. Hmm. into something I knew, something I like, and something that I do with others, where I'm not this governor general, I'm just me, the ordinary me. And and I do that through singing and through physical fitness, but, but through singing. So I look for choir. And because uh, Dixit Dominus uh, handles uh, virtual 
virtuistic piece. Uh, I hadn't sang. I sang with Tafu Music Baroque Orchestra many, many years earlier. I'm, I'm thinking, oh, that I need that. I need something, a challenge. So I, I, I typed Dixit Dominus Ottawa, and the Ottawa Back Choir showed up. So fantastic. I called the director. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And I always know where to look for you when you're with us. You're always end of row because you have to be able to get out quickly if necessary. So I always know if I need to eyeball, that's where to look as a conductor. And how, how have the last uh, few months been for you uh, this, during this lockdown period? How has it affected your work and your life? Uh, the work has, uh, has increased. Uh, like uh, many of us that, uh, who are in the governance aspect of things, uh, it, it was a very busy. We had a crisis and the government was going full steam. And I have a constitutional role to play. So I was, I was very present actually all the time. We also had uh, a number of tragedies uh, that happened in, in the country. Uh, maybe the listeners don't know about this, but we lost a number of our service members in accidents. And also we had a, a terrible shooting in the province of Nova Scotia. So that's some, I have responsibility in there to, uh, to comfort and console um, and, and, and be present for the families of the bereaved. So I did that too. But it, you see, for me, however, I must say I'm, I'm a former astronaut and we're pretty well trained for isolation and for, right. being, for having to talk to people on, on a digital screen, looking at a little sure. blinking red light. Uh, right. it's, it's actually quite ordinary. And oh. <laughs> I don't suffer too much from the isolation. But the last thing I'll say, and I know it's the same for you, is that I'm the mom of a 17 year old uh, and uh, I wouldn't have spent as much time with him if it hadn't been for the pandemic. So there's always within the worst hardship, worst adversity, there's always a little ray of sunshine and we just need to find it. Absolutely. Uh, beautiful words. I agree. I've had, I've had time with my little boy who's only, he's uh, turning two in August and it's been, it's been the silver lining. So, yeah. So listen, um, I can't, there's so much I need to ask you about and talk to you about today, but I generally start these conversations with something a little fun, which is a quick fire round uh, with the guests. And I know you are astonishingly fast on your feet, so I hope you're okay if we do this. A few, Maybe yeah. not. Um, the, the idea is uh, I basically give you uh, two words and you choose one. Um, and my temptation, if you were asking me these questions, would be always to say both to everything. But if you can, if you can, uh, can allow I yourself to choose pardon me can i say both if it is both well you, you can do whatever you want but it would be it would be <laughs> ideal if right. you could choose okay all right so let's let's try it here we go so mornings or evenings evenings city or country both solitude or social gathering solitude beethoven or beatles hmm. hard huh mozart Ha! All right, Mozart or Bach? <laughs> Both. Okay, Bach or Da Vinci? Uh, da Vinci. Da Vinci or Newton? Da Vinci. Very good. I had a. I, I told my my best friend who's a mathematician. I told him I was going to ask you that, and we had this big argument about what you would say. I apologize in advance. He thought you'd go for Newton. I thought you'd go for Da Vinci. Anyway, uh, we'll unpack that at a later stage. Ah, uh, but so, I can tell you why. I think uh, wait, I mean, you know, I having not that I don't like uh, Sir Isaac. Uh, uh, I'm a big fan uh, of physics, and because it rules the world. However, Da Vinci had so many other aspects. He brought to his curiosity for science. Uh, his curiosity for art is uh, creativity. He he did not deny his the both sides because I really believe that art and science are actually completely related, and mm -hmm. that uh, they're not they're not separate. Well, that's so. Th this is a, an area I want to get into you with you with the, dis the discussion, and it's precisely what I told my friend. I said, knowing what I know, I believe that she will go to, for Da Vinci because he was a polymath and because he, he rounded out his personality like that. Anyway, um, okay, virtual or live? Uh, it depends. It depends uh, if it's a performance from an orchestra live. If it is a, a, a war conference, it can definitely be a virtual. Okay. Um, sound or sight, if you had to choose one of the senses to listening or seeing, hearing or seeing? 
right sides sides yeah that's oh, i find that so hard as a musician i find that incredibly hard to uh read or write if you had to do one or the other write a book or read a book i can't write it so i have to choose read okay okay this know. is an easy one maybe mozart's jupiter or holst's planets <laughs> jupiter mozart <laughs> okay yes yes the whole planet you can imagine if you're an astronaut you hear it a lot i know right yeah. and it's not comfortable to sing as well for a singer uh, so. not at all um collectivism or individualism collectivism innovate or refine uh, both they're different sure uh, teach or learn a teacher learn uh learn okay diving or flying hmm both but flying if, okay. if 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 I, i you know like i'm forced to choose then i go in the air okay and then flying or singing mm, they're different uh i can i can do both okay. i can fly and sing that's true that's a great image that might be the next thing you can achieve is flying while singing well um, we were we, we were i have got to tell you an anecdote can i can i interrupt in this please flight? anytime um uh we were supposed to sing uh me and a, a crew member when we were in the shuttle on my first flight because we were deploying a a little a student satellite at the very end of the mission called starshine and we want we wanted to sing the uh one of the uh a piece from uh, hair the uh uh right. the, the musical. musical uh good morning starshine but uh, he 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 decided at the last second that he didn't want to do that because oh. i think it will expose so we didn't do it oh what a shame okay so i'm interested to see what you say to this one if you weren't an engineer scientist astronaut juno winning musician head of state <laughs> what would your dream job be <laughs> flying airplanes i'd be a really? pilot you already are though Uh yeah but I, I that was my dream job. Uh I became a really? pilot when I became an astronaut. I see. And okay. uh, well, I, I my dream job was to be an astronaut. So um so I was very lucky okay. that uh, life life provided me with that opportunity. Beautiful. And what what would you be least good at, do you think? Oh man, so many things. Do you have an hour? Yes, you do. <laughs> okay. Uh I am not a very good graphic artist uh, at all. Okay. And okay. According to my son, I'm not the best of cooks, but uh I said, is it edible? He says, yes. I said, okay. Well, at least that. Exactly. Right. <laughs> okay, we're nearly at the end of this fast round. Thank you for your um if you could beat anyone in history and talk to them, who would it be? If you uh, Well, now that we've talked about Leonardo da Vinci, uh clearly uh because he was a uh, before the uh the, before the Renaissance, before I mean at the very beginning of the Renaissance and before any of the uh uh scientific thinking started coming in he was a complete precursor and he lived very long for the period yeah. so yeah. it would have been fascinating i think yeah. to, to listen to him and and galileo yeah. a little bit later also and then uh and then um vivaldi because oh, beautiful answer um, because because of his of what he did yes uh he was uh, kind of a uh, um he had a job and and he was mm -hmm. writing this music uh i wish also to know you know I, i wonder how many people knew about his music if it was as popular as it is today that kind of thing right right yeah and what piece of music would you take this is the last one what piece of music would you take to a desert island i would take uh the torrente via uh the uh from the, the, from the Dixie Dominos the solo for two soprano uh, which we may hear later they they am i correct in saying that they played that to you from mission control when you were in the shuttle or did you play it in the shuttle oh no 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 they played for me uh what they do when we had the space shuttle which is now uh, retired you can visit space shuttles and museum now in the united states um they would wake up the crew we'd, we'd all wake up at the same time and all go to bed at the same time because we are synchronized with with the people mm -hmm. on the ground their construction mission of the international space station so they're very heavy uh scheduled so they would wake us up we're all sleeping uh in our sleeping bag inside the spaceship and then the music would come on the air and that's how they wake up the crew 
And depending which music it is, we all kind of look to each other with one eye open and saying, ah, country music, uh, uh, dogs, this is for it you. Must be. And of course, right. whenever there was classical music, they would say, Julie, Julie, <laughs> for you. So when it's for you, you're the one that then picks up the radio and says, good morning, Houston. I see. I so see. Wonderful. Uh, and that was really a real treat. Beautiful. Thank you for going through those questions. I appreciate it. And um, but oh, another you... anecdote I must say is that uh, because my second flight was a 16 day flight uh, of the mm -hmm. space shuttle, it's a long flight. I had two wake up call and my other one was the theme song of the 1960s show that Thunderbirds are go, which was composed by Barry Gray. A Fantastic. Great... English composer. Yes. Yeah, that's a great show. I grew up with the, the, that uh, music as well, not in the 60s, but in the 70s. Yes. So um, a reminder to our audience, if you have questions, please do send them through to us. And Musically Speaking um, is not just about conversation, it's also about listening to music. Um, and I'd like to begin with a beautiful clip that was recorded only a few weeks ago by the Ottawa Bar Choir with Her Excellency, um, as I mentioned, as a member. Um, would you like to introduce this, this clip for us and tell us how you put it together? Yes, uh, we, uh, we um, first of all, the reason why we did it is because I was talking to uh, young uh, two people on the front line, uh, uh, medical personnel, and they were saying that in the ICU, in the emergency ward, not only were they treating COVID-19 patients, but they were also accompanying uh, people in the last moment of life, and they didn't have any family members with them. So it was a heartbreaking uh, testimony from them, so we decided... Uh, with the Ottawa Back Choir to record just a little piece, three minutes, and yeah. make it available to the to the people, the frontline workers, so that if they wanted, you know, they would have it in their phone, they could take it out and at least play this little piece of music uh, mm -hmm. as they were accompanying uh, patients. And it's, of course, Donna Nobis Pachem, Doni Nulape, give us some peace. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you, Kelly. If you play the clip, please.
Just beautiful. So that was the uh, Ottawa Bark Choir and their recent uh, Juno Award winners. On Monday night, they won the Juno Award and they're performing the Donna Novus Pacem Grantas piece from Bach's B minor mass. And that was conducted by Dr. Lisette Canton and featured, among others, um, the Governor General of Canada, Julie Payette, uh, who's with us now. I love the little bark pillow that uh, the Lisette has placed in the background. I don't know if you saw it. Just behind her conducting, there's this, this cute little bark pillow. So how long has choral uh, singing been part of your life? I know you've been with that choir since you've been in Ottawa, but how long has it been part of your, your world? Oh. In, uh, am I okay? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I've got you now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. I, I always, I've always sung in choirs. I was in a, a, my primary school, a little choir, I guess, uh, when I was eight, and someone came to the school to audition uh, for a children choir, the Puerri Cantores, uh, for the Cathedral of Montreal. And I auditioned and I got in, and that was the the end of it for me. I always sang in choirs oh, from then on. Oh, that's and do you manage, considering the packed schedule that you have, do you, do you manage to actually go to rehearsals? Uh, the only time I could, I had to stop singing in choirs was during my years as an astronaut because they're the, uh, it was just impossible. And, and even now with Governor General, um, I can't make all the concerts, so I have to. But, but what, what is good is if we have a concert like you do with uh, the NAC Orchestra, yeah. where we have a very intensive week where we mm. rehearse, we, uh, we, we come prepare, of course, and then we do a few concerts and then it's over. That, it's easier for me to manage, but a very recurring schedule. When I was an astronaut, was not possible, but I formed sure. a little choir of astronauts for Christmas kids' skits. And so I never- In Houston? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I have the tape, oh. but uh, well, I don't show it. Really? It's terrible, yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. And you play the flute and the piano as well, is that correct? I, I, um, I was trained as a uh, first as a pianist, yes, as a kid as well. And do you but find I, time to integrate that into your life now? Uh, I always have a piano. I, mm. That I always do. If it's not a real piano, then it's an electronic piano. And I think right. I've, yeah. uh, uh, now I have music all over me because my 17-year-old is a guitarist. And uh, he wants to make a, a career as a musician. So he plays a lot. He composes his own song. So music is in our lives. Oh, fantastic. And so that was, of course, a virtual performance that we just saw from, from the Bar Choir. And what a, what a beautiful idea also for, 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 to, to provide that to the medical services. Um, it's a time when our stages have gone dark and audiences have been atomized around the world. Um, we touched on it in the kind of quick fire round, but as a, as a performer and a, and a music lover, what are your thoughts about the relationship between performers and an audience in this virtual world? How have you been experiencing it? Uh, we've, uh, we've talked a lot about this because I've, I also have conversations uh, with uh, performers uh -huh. and uh, I had uh, a number of talks with uh, artists uh, with uh, stage actors, uh, with people in the film industry, and of course musicians. And we all agree, it's irreplaceable. The live performances are ir irreplaceable. They cannot be the same on a virtual platform. However, the virtual platform can still bring emotion, energy, and, and, and uh, the solace that we get and the beauty that we get from music, but it's not the same. So I think that uh, right now, I call this period right now the transition. It's a transition period because most countries um, have brought down the epidemiology to a point where it's under control. And therefore, we're now uh, just waiting and trying mm -hmm. uh, stay on our guards, waiting for treatment and eventually a vaccine. That's the transition period because the virus is still there mm -hmm. and we are not out of the woods yet. So there is this transition period. How are we going to live that on the performing arts? And then afterwards, when we do, are we going to go back exactly to the same? I'm not sure about the after, but I think that the transition period, though, will see some reopening of mm. live performance. It's, it's too important, yes. but it will be in smaller groups. So maybe not the full-size symphonic orchestra and mm. not uh, everybody on... Uh, 
on every okay. seat. But that then brings in the economical and financial aspects as well. Uh, the arts cannot survive if they're not supported uh, and if people don't come and buy tickets to come and see the shows. Um, so if there are less people in a room, there's also less revenue. Um, and this is very important uh, that we continue to, uh, to support that. Uh, I think we have to have a dialogue also to how much are we willing as a society to invest in our performing arts. We tend to not think about, say, I'll say a musician. Um, you probably have seen that in your life where uh, people will, will, will uh, need a musician and they say, oh, can you, can you help me? Can you come and uh, sing at my wedding? Or, right. or But they don't even think of, of offering. Uh, yeah, <laughs> pain. But you would never think of going to the hairdresser or bringing a plumber in without paying these people. So why is it that when it's the beauty of music in particular, that uh, we have a, a sense that it belongs to us, that it's free? Uh, and it is free uh, from the soul, but mm. we all have, it, it's also a, um, a profession. And Absolutely. it's a beautiful profession, so. Yeah. And I find it, I mean, the, this question of beauty, I, I, I saw your, your conversation with Yannick Nisegan. He was pointing out, of course, that there are ways to support your local arts organizations. Uh, reach out to them if you're interested in, in finding out how they're doing and how you can support them. You can do that all over Canada. In fact, all over the world at the moment. They're, they're looking to stay in contact with patrons. Um, but I, I was thinking about that virtual aspect and, and how many things in life we, we, we experience virtually and take it for granted. And of course, one of them is space. There's only ever 550 people who have been to space. Maybe it's now 555. I was researching it. It seems to be 550 people. Um, and I was wondering, is there any aspect of what you experienced up there that we can recreate through the films, the images, the things that we see here on Earth? Or is it only ever a very poor facsimile of what you experienced in space? No, there's a lot we can recreate. Uh, and and uh, the most incredible aspect of going into a spaceship and orbit around the planet is, is actually the planet. It's to be mm. able to see Earth from space. And it's absolutely magnificent. I usually don't use many superlatives, but in this case, there's no other word. It's mm. magnificent. It's, mm. it's, it's precious. It's ours. And there's only one of it. And mm. as you go around the Earth uh, in a spaceship, uh, it, you go really, really fast. Yeah. It takes about an hour and a half to go around the Earth once to do one orbit, which means that we cross Canada in 10 minutes and, uh, and Britain in, uh, well, less than one. And uh, <laughs> so we get to see the entire world and we get to see the world during the daytime and the world during the nighttime. Every 45 minutes, actually, we go from day to night to day to night. And so the most incredible thing and I remember when I did that the first time on my first flight in 1999. At the time, we did not have iPods and, and, and uh, uh, modern uh, music uh, devices. We had those disc players with little, uh, little uh, earphones. So I had one. I put a CD in it, and I put my earphones, and I float to the window. And then I just looked down. And I had then the uh, uh, Marcello's uh, oboe concerto, the second movement. I remember that. And I'm listening to this absolutely gorgeous music, the oboe line. And I'm looking at the earth passing by. Uh, there are people on earth. There, there are joys and there are suffering and there is life. We are in a tin can in space. So what you can reproduce, I think, is that is those music, when you mm. look at them, um, there is a, uh, a time when, a, in, in, when there was a, um, a, space, uh, uh, a space probe, uh, it was called Juno. Mm -hmm. I'm not making this up, it was called Juno. <laughs> and it came back swinging around the Earth, it was going to, uh, to Jupiter. And uh, as it swung by, uh, in order to test the camera, uh, they opened up all the camera and this, this probe then filled mm. the planet with the moon on the same frame. You can see the Earth rotating on itself mm. and then mm. the moon rotating around. 
it's incredible. So they accelerated all this and uh, Vangelis wrote mm. a piece. This is exactly, you can find it on the, on the, on the yeah. web. Uh, this is exactly what I'm saying. You can transpose the music onto these celestial mm. ballet, mm. which you get to see, and then you get to experience really the feeling of belonging. Yeah, that's one. And actually, there's, there's a, um, for any of our viewers who are, who are interested, there's, there's many, many opportunities online to, to hear Her Excellency speak. But there's a, 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 a lecture I enjoyed very much from the Perimeter Institute. It's 10, 10 years old nearly, it's from 2012, um, where you show uh, videos of yourself in space and you talk about it. And you talk about traveling around the Earth. You talk about the borderless Earth as, as it is observed from the sky. And there's many aspects of things that you touch on there that, that touch actually on metaphysics as well, I find. And, and that's an area I want to explore with you in a second because music and, and art and sciences there is this interweaving but a, a question I have a, a prior to that is that when I look at your life and and uh, and sort of all the, th the things that you've achieved I notice that you consistently put your individual skill at the service of a team be that a choir or a research group or a space mission crew um, and is that a is that a conscious decision that you've made or has that happened by chance I think, uh, you know, honestly, I think we all do that quite a lot. I, you, you, you are uh, the director, the maestro of a of a team. Uh, yeah. the, the what you create is impossible to do alone. Um, mm. I, I I don't think it's conscious, but the first time when I I really I realized this was a big deal for me that I really care about being a team player, is actually when I was asked that question during the astronaut recruitment. When they were selecting astronaut uh, in 1992 in Canada, uh, at the final stages, they, they would ask questions uh, in an interview. And they asked me, what makes you a team player, madame? And I replied, well, I've been singing in choirs, <laughs> for little girls. And I so I can follow direction. I can change tempi and I can, you know, like, uh, harmonize my voice with other people so i believe i'm a team player and then i went back to my hotel room after that interview and i thought oh my god what have i done i'm applying to one of the most <laughs> critical jobs on earth or actually outside earth and i'm talking about choral singing mm. well they picked me so i guess yeah. it's, well, it's very, one of uh, one of my closest friends he he had music all through his childhood he was predestined to become a musician and he decided uh, in his early 20s, he wanted a different direction, and he went from music college to, to study philosophy and politics and economics in Oxford. Um, oh. And he thought, when, when he applied, he thought, I have no chance because I have a music degree. But they, they valued it so highly because of the ability, firstly, the individual discipline you have to bring, but then you put that discipline at the service of others. You listen, you communicate, you follow, you react, and you can't hold on to dogma too tightly. You have to be informed. And you have to be excellent, but you also have to respond and act as part of a team, which, again, listening to your talk about space, you're saying everything happens in groups of twos. Um, you, you don't act on your own ever because of error. You want to mitigate that, um, which I found, again, it, it spoke to so many aspects of, of what I value in, in music. Um, but I would imagine that you're, although you're surrounded by people on a daily basis in your current role, when I look at your life, I could imagine that this might be the most solitary job you've ever had, actually. Is that is that fair, or has has this been a team experience as well? Uh, it, it is both. Uh, the The function itself, uh, I would say, yes, is a is a solitary one, um, but it is it is accompanied by a team. Um, mm. There is a a level at which uh, people see the function. Uh, which which startled me at first. That's why uh, I was saying about anchoring uh, into mm -hmm. into teamwork and in and into something I was comfortable with, which is singing with others. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. sing a, by myself because of that uh, uh, distanciation, really, uh, within within the function. So I try actually quite hard to to mm -hmm. reduce that that distance. Uh, because I'm, I, I'm not comfortable uh, very much, though I'm very comfortable being alone. It's not yes. being alone, it's, it's being distanced from other yes. people, which, which, which I don't like. But I must say, however, that I've gained a new, uh, a new, I already was so admirative, now I gain a new admiration 
for anybody who has got the courage of recording their voice uh, by themselves in order to make <laughs> the kind of mosaic that we saw, whether it is the voice or whether it's a musician, because I was absolutely frightened when I heard myself, because we all record in our homes, yeah, before it's put together. And, and I'm like, I'm not going to send that out. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> but, but fortunately, yeah. other people were singing. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, it's, I remember one of my teachers always saying that you, if you play at home, if you do everything at home as if it were on stage, that's the best kind of practice. Because it shouldn't then be a shock when you hear yourself back, right? You should be so focused on every detail that you, I do this because I'm a cellist, but on every detail of what you do, that every sound is so perfect that it would never be a shock, but it's still, I, everybody gets that. It's like hearing your, your voice in an answer machine. It's not fun. You know? um, oh, that's a lot yeah. harder than uh, to fly on a rocket ship, I can assure oh, you. Oh, I don't. It takes enormous courage. It's so exposed. And I wonder, if, I read that your, your father was an engineer, and, and if it's correct what I read, then your mother was, was a, a theater accountant. So I, I can see how science was part of your life and critical thinking. At what stage did music come into your life at home, so to speak? Was or was it in you? Uh, I, I I remember uh, starting piano lessons uh, about the same time when I started a choir. Uh, so and the choir was uh, twice a week. So I did that for mm -hmm. several years into my teenage years. Uh, music but was, was there. Your, was it your? Did you before joining the choir? Did you sing at home? Did you did you play piano at home, or was it outside of the household that you you had those impulses? I had a piano at home. We had a piano, a, a big, big upright piano, and uh, we also I also sang outside. Uh, and then I went to school. I did um, the equivalent of the uh, O levels in Britain at, uh, at a uh, in, Wales. in Wales, and uh, there I took music. First time, like a, like a real music classes. And uh, when I came back home after uh, those two years in Wales, I, uh, I actually sat uh, at McGill University in Montreal uh, on the, on the uh, wall, uh, because the engineering faculty is right across from the music faculty in oh, McGill right. University. And I sat there because I had applied to both, thinking I'd really, really like to do a degree in music. Right. And, and then I thought, well, I don't think I can, you know, I'm, I'm good enough to make a real living in music, but I think I can make a living as an engineer and mm -hmm. do music. So that's why I chose engineering. And then I took all my electives into the music faculty next, oh, next across the it's street. A, it's and a good was, choice because if you have that passion, it's never going to go away and music can be around you. That was a wonderful choice. But it, speaking of education, I noticed on my travels that the, 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 the arts is generally somewhat on decline in schools, so in high schools, I mean by that, and younger. Um, and in most countries, not all by any means, but in most countries, the emphasis is very much on the STEM subjects, um, and access to the arts is often limited to families who are able to pay for after school programs, which has an effect of reducing the talent pool, and also it skews the demographic then of, of people in the arts, because if it's only a certain demographic getting access, then it's going to, you know, in the profession be the same. Um, I, of course, wouldn't want to become political on a national scale in this question, but in your impression of, let's say, the Western world, how do you think we are valuing arts and providing access to them for, for young people? I, I feel that uh, this, the, the, this is an important question, and I, I've um, researched that before I became Governor General. Uh, this is of big importance to me. Uh, of course, when resources become scarce or when, uh, when uh, the system cannot provide all of this, then it will then uh, stay with reading, writing, counting as being the main, the main subjects that we will teach in uh, our children. And we push aside, uh, I call them the three pillars that should not be pushed aside, which is physical education, uh, arts in general, and music. Mm. We know for sure, because there's many studies that have uh, corroborated that, that uh, uh, being trained in music at an early age is excellent for the development of a, of a person later on, even if they don't become a musician. Mm. It, 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 tickles some of the brain that uh, and develops those parts uh, and that then stays with us for the rest of our lives. So we should actually be very conscious of the artistic part, the musical part, 
and the physical part and and in, include that always as as far as much as possible in the education and yes it should be available to all yeah yeah and uh, we just uh, we heard Bach and he's perhaps the example of a composer whose technical and structural elegance and sophistication makes his work as beautiful to sort of analyze and study on the page as it is to perform and listen and it's the sort of science of art if you will and of course as we've touched on there's so much beauty and art in science how how do they coexist in in your mind personally do you are they completely interwoven or are they quite separated the two words ah, i like that question maestro uh i i love answering that question because this is my thought my thought is we have both all of us uh the the, the mm. more cartesian mind and the more artistic side we all have it uh when you look at any uh um a first cellist in an orchestra, uh, you have to have had a very disciplined uh, way of, of approaching. You have a, a background, you know, you can't do music just like that. You have to learn the tricks, the, the, the techniques, and you have to apply that. You have to be able to read music and to interpret. And then you put your creativity on top of it. And that's when it blossomed. Well, an inventor, uh, somebody, a problem solver, an engineer, is very much in a way the same thing. It's 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 the same background, solid formation that you that you know, and then in order to solve the problem, then you have to let to open up your creativity often, and uh, some have a bit more of the one part than the other part. But I really truly believe we have both. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm, I'm thrilled to hear you uh, say the same thing, you know, coming from a, from a different perspective. Um, now, you mentioned your son as a musician earlier, and we were going to play um, a piece by Leonard Cohen, which was performed at your investiture. Uh, we were going to perform that version of it. But uh, there's a brand new version, um, <laughs> which was released yesterday. Uh, and I believe your son is on it as well. So could you tell, you, tell us a little bit about what we're about to hear? Well, first, I, I must say what a privilege when I was installed as governor general in 2017, I chose every piece uh, that mm -hmm. will play at that. So that for a, a musician, um, uh, a wannabe <laughs> almost yeah. uh, like I am, it, it was uh, so much fun. Uh, and I decided for the uh, Canada Day video that we released yesterday, 1st of July, um, to record a new rendition of Hallelujah. So I asked a friend, musician, which I did uh, uh, pay, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to, to make a new version of this. So it's a quartet of four men, quartum, a lead singer, uh, Marie-Christine de Petre, and then two guitarists, and me on kind of the background vocals. Uh, so one of the guitarists is my son, and we recorded this session uh, completely physically distanced in a studio in Montreal a few weeks ago. Um, okay. And it was a wonderful moment. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to hear it, but maybe you could give us a couple of minutes of this. It would be wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. depending on our life experience. I believe there are many crossroads along the road of life where we have to make choices and decide which direction we take. This is exactly what we witness throughout the country in these trying times. The virus brought physical distancing and social isolation, pain and death. In response, Canadians chose compassion and solidarity. They chose to live with one eye on their individual needs and the other eye on the common good. And we were quick to reinvent ourselves, from teleworking to online classes, from virtual artistic performance to two-meter shopping. We have adapted and found creative ways to connect, to support each other, to reach out, Hallelujah. to graduate, to show gratitude, Hallelujah. to play outside, to train, 
to perform, and to inspire. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty and moonlight overthrew you. The pandemic has also forced us to look beyond ourselves, because we love each other, even at a distance. It has forced us to make sure that we support workers, families, and businesses, that we stand for the most vulnerable, the less fortunate, that we ensure the security and well-being of all, and that we denounce hatred and violence in all its forms. Because the inequalities and the racial divides of our society resurfaced in the fury, exposing again the flaws and shortcomings that we so need to address. Our diversity is one of our greatest assets. There would be no invention, no creativity, no freedom if we were all the same. What makes us unique, our differences, are the strength of our nation's fabric. Just like the toddlers grow into adults, did a mature 153-year-old Canada grow into a caring nation? Will we remember the lessons of the 2020 pandemic, of the unspeakable shooting in Nova Scotia, of the importance of reconciliation? I am confident that we have, and that we will not remain indifferent, because we care. Today, let us celebrate the generosity and the resilience of everyone throughout the country, proud and free. Happy birthday, Canada. Wow, what a lovely idea and what an important uh, message at this time. And that song obviously has um, an importance to you. If it was in your investiture and, and you're using it now, what's your relationship to Leonard Cohen's music there? I, I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm a fan. I, I've never mm. met or, or, or Mr. Cohen uh, when he was living. I, it's mm. just, it just uh, it's a beautiful song it's, uh, it, and it's very profound. I agree. It's. I mean, he, he, as a lyricist, he was extraordinary, and the there is a sophisticated simplicity and elegance to that that song, uh, which is sort of breathtaking. It must be one of the most beloved songs on earth, and I always try to put my finger on why. Um, and I wonder sometimes if it's the <clears throat> it's the fourth the, the, the text. Fifth. <laughs> Right, exactly, as he said it. So what, what we, we, we haven't got much time left. I have a couple of, of questions uh, that I wanted to still ask you. Do you have a, a musical experience that you would define as your most moving um, up to now in life? Well, that's the beauty of music. I, as you know, there's, there's moments like that that come. Uh, and I've had some at the NAC uh, the past year. Um, but uh, yeah. there was this one time because and that's again where you'll see where art and the science of of the physical world get together we were i was uh, singing with a small ensemble in uh, in montreal uh, and we were singing a a, a, um, a song by zoltan kodai uh, two choirs and we were singing to one another because there was a response type and then whoops sometimes we would get together sometimes a little dissonance and uh, and we had rehearsed that uh, quite a lot, and we're in this church facing each other. And as we sang, I don't know, we had one of those incredible moments where we actually sang perfectly in tune, and we mm -hmm. got the response. And it amplified because you know that sound is waves, yes. And if you have sound many waves. waves, and all the peaks are at the same place, well, it amplifies. That's that's the physics of uh, sound waves, and uh, it did. It did. You could feel the resonation, and and there was only us, the choir, hmm. uh, and maybe uh, ten people. <laughs> I was gonna actually. Oh, sorry. I was, no, I was, it's I was, that's I was it. It was, it was an extraordinary moment of physics and 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 artistic uh, a moment. I it was it just all came together and, and got amplified. It's like yeah. if we, we were five hundred, and we were Stunning. only. Stunning. And, you know, on uh, the lines of your, your video, you, you mentioned in, in the, 
the lecture I saw you do from the Perimeter Institute, the, the borderless nature of Earth from space. And as a, as a conductor, um, I noticed that the application and discipline and craft um, and collaboration that's required to play any symphonic work around the world, you see it, it's the same among humans. It doesn't matter where they are, that, that focus and coming together is the same and the same in choruses. In, in an age in which important questions are being asked about identity um, and in which some respects uh, what divides us is being emphasized as heavily as what unites us. What role do you think collaborations like the ISS, like choirs, like symphony, what, what can they teach us about how we can mesh together? Sorry, uh, to ask no, that question with no, one minute I, left. <laughs> I appreciate that because it, I, I, I really think, and I use the example of the International Space Station constantly. We mm. Right now on board, there are three Americans and two Russians, and uh, the ISS will celebrate its 20th anniversary in orbit uh, in November, and we don't talk about it ever. We don't read about it in the front page of the newspaper because people get along every day, 365 days a, a year. Yeah. And we are, it's a good example to show that if we want to, we can. We, we can. Uh, we can, it, it won't be ever, ever perfect, but we can bridge the distance. We can work together if we have a, a common goal and uh, a common interest, and if we share properly. Uh, I think it's a good example. I think it is in, in, in the collaboration that you see amongst uh, the people, the solidarity, the compassion that people have not developed, that they have in it, and that they're using now a little bit more because of the crisis of the, uh, pandemic Absolutely. i don't it, i i i believe that uh, we 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 ought to do a bit more every single one if every single one of us makes a bit more effort to to share collaborate leave room for the other and appreciate the differences uh i think we will be uh, improving our world in general we have a long way to go unfortunately <laughs> Well, listen, um, Your Excellency Julie, um, on behalf of the National Arts Center um, and everybody who's watching, uh, thank you for so generously giving of your time today and for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, any nation would consider itself lucky to have such an inspiring polymath at the helm, uh, leading by example, and I can't tell you what a privilege it has been to, to, to have the opportunity to speak to you. And um, we're going to, uh, I'll come back in a moment to say uh, thank you to sponsors and things, but uh, as, as a goodbye, I thought we would play um, a little excerpt from Tafel Musik. Uh, they are uh, dear friends of yours, you, you've sung with them many times before. Um, if you have 30 seconds just to speak about your relationship to them, and then we'll play the clip. Again, the same story. I came to the to Toronto to do my master's degree in engineering, and as soon as I arrived, I looked for a choir. And right next door was Tafu Music Baroque Orchestra. So I auditioned and I got in the choir, and uh, I sang with them for the three years that I was in Toronto. I can't live without music, and I know you can't either. No. By the way, I have to say because I know many of the listeners are from Britain, that tomorrow because the astronaut fraternity, brother, brotherhood or community is so small, I am doing a one hour feature for young kids with oh, no other than Tim Peak. Great. OK, fantastic. So even even, uh, 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 you know, now in this virtual world, there is uh, a strong tie between uh, yeah. these two countries. So thank you so much for giving okay. me an opportunity Great. to speak with you, Maestro. You. I look forward. Uh, to joining you, hopefully, in the years to come again at the NEC. I look forward to it. Much health to you. And this is the um, uh, Vivaldi Concerto for two violins in A major, mm. uh, which uh, Tafel Music performed as part of their Galileo project, Music of the Spheres, <laughs> which used high-definition images from Hubble Telescope and Canadian astronomers. You see how we've collected it all together. Um, thank you Thanks. again so much, and let's enjoy some Vivaldi. Thank you.
Wonderful tarpa music uh, performing Vivaldi's Concerto for two violins in A major as part of their Galileo uh, project. Uh, thank you for joining us today and listening to um, the Governor General, Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Julie Payette, uh, talk about her extraordinary life and her perspective on uh, art and music and science. Um, I would like to say a big thank you to uh, the National Arts Center and to Facebook who uh, allow this to happen by uh, sponsoring it and supporting it. I'll be back at the same time next week, not in two weeks, but next week on July 9th as part of a big Beethoven celebration that we're doing at the National Arts Center. And I'll be speaking to my dear friend, the violinist Daniel Hope, who is also president of the Beethoven House in Bonn. So he's got perfect credentials to talk about Beethoven. Um, please do check out the NAC website, which is www.nac-cna.ca, where there's uh, fabulous content from our musicians uh, in our daily lunch breaks. They've been so active uh, putting out content um, and it's, there's so much to enjoy there. And you can sign up for free weekly symphony concerts from our archives. Uh, just visit the website and look for NACO Home Deliveries. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, please also do follow uh, and like this page. Um, it's Alexander Shelley Conductor on Facebook or uh, Alexander underscore Shelley on Instagram or at Shelley Conduct on Twitter. There's so many different platforms. Uh, and uh, you'll get a heads up about musical offerings and, and discussions and talks like this as they're coming along. Most importantly, please stay safe, look after one another and uh, enjoy music and art where and when you can. I can't wait to see you next time. Thank you for being with us.